See, because the truth of the matter is chemistry comes and goes. But commitment is forever. And, and people just don't understand. They're like, I, I, you know, I just don't feel. He said, be content with what you have. But it's hard to be content with something you don't have. And then, of course, you know, it leads to marital problems. And then one steps out on the other. And then it's now, well, he's this and she's that and she's this. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hi, and welcome to Stone Point Community Church, where your life is made better. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and thanks for supporting the ministry. If you enjoyed today's message, why don't you be a blessing and share it with a friend? We appreciate you and pray for God's very best in your life. If you would, let's turn to the book of Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And uh, we are on our last day of the elephant in the bedroom. (laughs) I don't don't know if y'all glad it's the last day or you're glad we're still on the subject. (laughs) Not sure how to take that. But okay. Just because of that, (laughs) the gloves are coming off. (laughs) If you would, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, and the eyes of them both were what? And they knew that they were, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Um, They both ate, and it says, she gave him some. When he ate, their eyes, both their eyes were opened. In other words, both sets of eyes. And it's interesting because the Bible says that through one man, uh, sin entered the world. It doesn't say through one woman and one man. It just says through one man. And so their eyes weren't opened until Adam crossed the line. God told Adam not to eat of the tree. He didn't tell Eve. I don't have time to unpack all that, but... If you look for yourself, you will find that God never instructed Eve not to do it. He instructed Adam. And Adam, as the responsible party for his home, was supposed to protect his home. And the moment that he partook of it, their eyes were both opened. And I think one of the main things that's important is that God instituted the relationship. If you remember, man did not say it wasn't good for him to be alone. God said it's not good for man to be alone. And so God instituted that relationship. God gave man, woman, and took woman out of man and gave it to man. That's where we get woman taken from the womb of man. And so God recognized and realized that A man by himself is just not good. And anybody who's ever left their husband home all day (laughs) knows that that is an absolute fact. It's not good for a man to be alone. Um, So when you think about God's design and, and the plan that God had for mankind, He gave Adam dominion in his home. He gave Adam responsibility in his home. And here, the moment their eyes were opened, they began to realize they were naked. Now, here's my question. Once they ate of the fruit, were they naked before they ate of the fruit? So then... 
being naked wasn't the problem. It was that as they became exposed to sin, their view of nakedness changed. Are, are you with me? Because the simple fact of them being naked had not changed. They were naked before. And now all of a sudden, because their view had changed, now they're trying to resolve something through a humanistic way. They're trying to cover up with leaves. What God had revealed later that you can't cover with leaves, you have to cover with blood. And if you notice Cain and Abel, one is a farmer, one is a herdsman. Animals versus plants. The first thing Adam did was try to cover up what he did with a plant. And God said, no, we're going to have to make a sacrifice. We're going to have to close you with animals and with blood. Because the only thing that can resolve sin is blood. Are you with me? So in the fact that they have now a new view of life, one that God didn't give them, because if God had a problem with their nakedness, he would have said something. But he didn't. He didn't have a problem with it until they had a problem. And he wondered, who told you you were naked? In other words, where would you get this idea from? So <clears throat> let's go to Proverbs real quick. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15 in the King James. It's very simple to give the God through Stone Point. The first one, you can scan the QR code. The second one, you can visit us at scc.church, click the donate icon, fill out the required details, and bam, you're done. Drink waters out of thy own cistern, and running waters out of thy own well. Let thy fountain be dispersed abroad, and the rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thy own, and not strangers with thee. Let the fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and a pleasant doe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And thou be ravished always with her love. Why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Look at somebody next to you and tell them, use it or lose it. Tell somebody else, use it or lose it. You know, um, Solomon had 700 wives, and he had 300 concubines. <clears throat> um, for those of you that are not familiar with that type of term, you would call it a side chick, <laughs> a sneaky link. 300. One of the, one of the challenges as, as parents, and often it is uh, a struggle when dealing even in relationships with friends and things like that, where when you give advice, you are often seen as hypocritical if you did the same thing. The problem is that if I was in business and I gave you some business advice from a place of what I've experienced, you would call me wise. But if I tell you not to sleep around, and your answer is, well, you did, well, then that validates my advice and counsel. Because now I'm telling you not what I heard. But it's amazing to me how the difference between what is considered good advice and what is considered hypocritical is sorely based on the recipient's desires. If I'm helping you to avoid what you believe to be pleasure, then it's hypocritical. If you can see how I'm helping you avoid pain, then all of a sudden, that's wisdom talking. It's almost like when you look at David, David was a great king. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Yet David did some very despicable and horrible things. 
But yet and still, God still said, David was a man after his own heart. The Bible then, when it talks about Solomon, it says that Solomon had so many wives that they started to lead him away from God. And he did not, the Bible exactly says, he did not have the heart of his father. When you think about having 700 wives, that's like driving 700 cars all at the same time. But then imagine having 300 concubines. I mean, dear God. You could go for three years and never see the same one twice. Are you, I mean, I mean, it just it just boggles the mind. But what ended up happening was Solomon, although had an assignment, his assignment was derailed by his passions. And so Solomon then writes in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, and, and he says in verse 15, drink water out of your own cistern, running waters out of your own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and of rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be thine own and not strangers with you. Let thy fountain be blessed. And he says, rejoice. In the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and a pleasant doe, and let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished with her love. Wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Isn't it something that his mother? was a strange woman to David. While David was his father, Bathsheba was his mother. And you almost begin to wonder if the insatiable nature of his appetite was fueled by the knowledge of how his father dealt with his mother. And wondering, now David's a great king. David is a great warrior. But David was a terrible father. Amen. Terrible. And so as he's giving this advice, this wisdom, because I hate to cheapen wisdom down to advice because it's not just advice, it's actually wisdom. He says, why would you be taken with a strange woman? Now, most people, when they hear that, they think, well, that woman to me isn't a stranger. I know her. He doesn't mean that. Strange doesn't mean foreign. Strange means there's something wrong with her. <laughs> it, mean, it means she's wicked. And wicked means twisted. See, he says, let your fountain be something that you don't share with strangers. If she's willing to bring somebody else into your marital bed, she's, he says, something's wrong. Now, now remember, Solomon is writing this, and he's saying, listen, don't make the mistakes that I have made. Because what I didn't do is I didn't pay attention to these women and 300 on one side pieces and 700 wives later, you talk about Wilt Chamberlain. Is this what he's saying? And he's saying, don't ever get captivated. He said, you drink from your own well. He said, don't let strangers drink from it. <laughs> he says, in different translations, say unusual women. 
immoral women. Uh, the message Bible says seductive women or wicked. In other words, they just have twisted answers. They have twisted views. The world works sex in a way that it tries to get you to think that sex is casual. Um, you can't even watch a, a TV ad. You got an ad for a refrigerator and she's in a bikini. For what purpose? Are you going to get in the refrigerator? I mean, are you cold? And, that, and, and so, I mean, what, 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 what's the plan here? Well, there is no plan. The plan is just to give you a twisted, wicked, twisted view. And so they paint it as, oh, it's just casual and, you know, people are having sex with each other and it's just, you know, it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. And men with men and women with women and women with men and then men with women who women are with men and men and then the women are with the men and the men with, who are with the same men are with different women. Dear God. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, he had 700 wives. Well, some of y'all ladies got 700 husbands. What's your body count? <clears throat> Jesus met the woman at the well. Told you the gloves were coming off. I eased you right into that. Jesus met the woman at the well. She said, she said, sir, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. <laughs> He said, you had all these husbands, and the one you're with ain't your husband. Didn't he? And she said, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't say. Really? <laughs> what gave it away? The fact that I know your body count better than you do? <laughs> and so there's a view. Right? I can do what I want. It's my body. I can do whatever I want, however I want, with whomever I want. And there's views like, well, you know, maybe I did live a certain way. And I'm, uh, and I'm, I'm a changed man. I'm a changed woman. But then how do I recover from all that? Because how do I distance myself from my past? How do I let the world know that my past is no longer my future. And it's interesting. Can you go to Genesis 4.1? It's very simple to give online. There are only five steps to follow. Step one, go to our website, www.stonepointcc.org or for short, scc.church. Step two, then click on PayPal or donate icon located at the top of the page. Step three, you are asked for whatever amount you desire to give. After you have done so, click the donate option down below. Step four, on this page, you have to notate what you are giving for where it says add a note. Whether it is tithe, offering, building fund, love offering, guest offering, and so on. Step five, fill out the required details, then scroll down to the bottom of the page and click donate now, and you're done. It says in Adam, he did what? He knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, right? So let's stop right there. It isn't complicated to figure out that if the Bible says he knew his wife and she conceived, then that means to know his wife means to be intimate with his wife. Would you agree? Good. When Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. There is a difference between that and when Mary said, how could I have a child seeing I know no man? Did she know of a man? But she knew no man. Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they, not what they do. There are two words, typically, in the Greek that are, that are demonstrative of the word 
no or interpreted as the word no. Um, oidos and gnosko. Oidos is intelligence. It, it is uh, the ability to assess based on purely intelligence. Then gnosko is a perception based on experience. It's the ability to understand something because you've had an experience. When Adam knew his wife, it means he had an experience with her. It wasn't that he had information about her. It was that he knew her. He knew her intimately. He had a, a intimate knowledge of her. He had the ability to become close with her in such a way that she knew him and he knew her in only a way that a husband would know their wife. And when people seem to think that intimacy is casual, they are completely defiant to the concept that because sex was God-created, it ought to be God-governed. There is, and, and, and here's what happens, right? So then people get saved, and they come into the church. And then when they come into the church, they start thinking back to all the things that their well-meaning parents said about how bad and how dirty sex is. And they told them that to keep them from doing it. But never told them the truth that it, in its proper context, there's nothing wrong with it. Hence, it's become... And what most people don't understand is that if I lit a fire right here in this building, most of you would be like, what is he doing? It's not that fire is bad. It's in the wrong. And this is where people struggle because they don't understand that it wasn't a problem until it became There was nothing wrong with them walking around in the garden naked until it was. <laughs> it wasn't a problem to be intimate and know your wife until that ain't your husband. That is not your wife. And having a proper biblical view is extremely important because sex is not just an activity. It's not just recreational. It's not just a sport. God doesn't see it that way. And what people call sexual freedoms today is really bondage. And it's amazing how God put in us the desire to be intimate. And if he put it in us, why would he frustrate it? Why would he give you a desire and then cause it to be frustrated? I'll give you an example. Women have a cycle, right? Women <laughs> have a cycle. Yes? yes? Despite the world trying to say that men... Men don't have a cycle. Now, a woman has a cycle about every roughly 30 days. 28, 30, depends on a woman, right? So every 30 days, her cycle runs. Yet a man, he does have a cycle, but his is only maybe a glass of juice and a sandwich and he's ready again. <laughs> now, I, I want you to understand why God did that. Because it's, it's really a basic thing. Because you don't know that month cycle, you got to be ready. <laughs> it's the difference between shooting one bullet at a time and a hundred at a time. You fire off a thousand bullets, you got to hit something. 
<laughs> the odds of you missing are slim. But could you imagine if he gave man one cycle a month and gave her one cycle a month? It'd be hit or miss. More miss than hit. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, right? I mean, it's pretty basic. But the problem becomes, if a man has in him the innate desire, and his desire at times, because I've counseled both sides of the situation. I've counseled wives that are, are after their husbands and the husbands ain't interested. And I've counseled husbands that are after their wives and the wives ain't interested. And it, and, and it usually stems down to how people see it. They see it as, well, it's not necessary. Or it's, it's just, you know, if I'm not tired. Come on now. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> you should see how some of these people are looking at me. Dear <laughs> God, man. So <laughs> you understand that sex is the canary in the mine. Um, the canary in the mine is where in the days where they did mining, uh, somebody, typically the foreman on the job, he would have a canary in a cage. And they would take the canary into the mine with him. And if that canary, the canary is very sensitive to oxygen levels, gas, those type of things. If that canary stops making noise and keels over, you have a very short period of time to get out of there before you will be killed over just like the canary. So they call it the canary in the mine because the canary in the mine was the, the harbinger. It was the signal that something is wrong and get out. <laughs> right? And so, listen, so think about that. Sex is the canary in the mine. When a marriage is in existence and there is no sex life that is mutually uh, agreeable to both parties. It's the canary in the mind. And people think, oh, it's no big deal. Well, it's no big deal until she's in the arms of somebody else. Then it's a big deal. It's no big deal until he's in the arms of some other person looking for something that you have convinced him you're not the supplier of. All right, well, let me show it to you. <laughs> Hebrews 13, because see, y'all can get mad at me all you want to, but you can't get mad at God. Hebrews 13, verse 4. That keeps me out of the fray. I've been attending Stone Point Community Church for 11 years now, and I absolutely love it. It's my church home. I have a three-year-old daughter named Mayana, and it's extremely important for me to set the right example for her when it comes to honoring God with my finances. God has been so good to me with my business that tithing has given me a steady flow of income. I'm a hairstylist and I'm fully convinced that because I've been faithful with my tithing that my clients book appointments and come in like clockwork. Before they weren't seeing me as often, now they see me on a consistent basis even after doubling my price for my haircuts. My name is Ator Benjamin and this is my tithing testimony. Marriage in all. And the bed, but, and God will judge. So marriage is honorable in everything. And your marriage bed, the bed between you and your spouse, is undefiled. You know what that means? That means enjoy it. That means if you want to swing from the chandeliers, knock yourself out. It should, it should be a conversation before you get married, though. It really should. That's one of the things you should talk about. What are you into? Well, I'm into this. I'm into that. You know, you got you to gotta have those types of conversations. Most people, oh, that's uncomfortable. No, it's not uncomfortable. It's only uncomfortable if you're trying to have that conversation while you Netflix and chill. 
But when you have that conversation out in a public place, say, there's some things we need to talk about. I like to dress up like Catwoman (laughs) and spray the floor with baby oil. And if you ain't into that, that's your moment. Like, nah, that's too much for the kid. Can't handle that. Because the last thing you want is to be in your merit, you know, your marital moment, and here she come popping out the closet. <laughs> Gordon baby all everywhere. No, whoa. <laughs> Flag on the play. <laughs> Ten yard penalty, unnecessary roughness on the offense. <laughs> right? Let the church say. But if y'all in it together, and it's like, look, I, we we compatible in this area. It's, it's all good. She jump out looking like Catwoman. You jump out looking like Batman. <laughs> and, and as they say, it's on and. Why? Because the marriage bed is. Watch what he says. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. What is a whoremonger? A whoremonger is someone who goes around whoring around. Like a common whore. That's what the Bible says. Stop, I mean, y'all can read. That's a person who ain't married, right? Can you commit adultery if you're not married? Somebody got to be married in order to commit adultery. Right? So then adulterers are people who are and go outside of their covenant to get what they need. Now watch what he says. This is tough, Joe. I might let you preach the rest of this one. (laughs) Let your conversation be without covetousness. In other words, let your manner of life be without desiring or coveting what you don't have. And be with such things as you do have, right? For he has said, I will never. (coughs) Is it possible to be content? Then why are so many people? If he tells you to be something, is it possible? And he says, I will never. Now, there's two things he's addressing here. This is what I love about the Bible. The first thing he's addressing is the fact that in the marriage covenant is just like a covenant, the covenant with you and God. And he says, I will never forsake you. Therefore, if you need to apply pressure, quit applying pressure on people and apply it towards the covenant. So, for example... There's a lot of people who have need, right? They need money, they need this, they need that. And they'll put pressure on people to give it to them. And they put no pressure on God to supply it. Give versus supply, two different things. I don't have time to preach that. Throw it to your raw, cook it yourself. But the point is, God is saying, I will never forsake you because you're in covenant with me. So then... If he'll never forsake you, then he's saying the same thing is supposed to be accurate about your spouse. Meaning, your spouse should never forsake you. So let's define forsake. You want to? Good. Because you're going to get it anyway. (laughs) To leave someone entirely in a moment of need. To leave someone entirely in a moment of need. He said, I'll never forsake you. Your job is to put pressure on your covenant. And if you put pressure on your covenant, the marriage bed is undefiled. So the request is to be made within your marriage and not outside of it. But the flip side is, if the request is made within your marriage, then your partner husband or wife, is responsible to never leave you in a moment of need. Hence, we create the obligation or the obligatory nature of a covenant. 
that we stood before God and said, I covenant with you. And so now the question becomes, if I have a need, where do I go for that need? (laughs) Roll the tape. (laughs) Video number one, please. Let's watch. Hi, Bear. Just wondering if maybe we could like put the video games down for a little bit. I just, I feel like we have not spent any time together or gone on a date or anything. I'm just, I'm missing that connection, that intimacy with you. I'm kind of playing video games right now. I'd kind of rather do this. Quality time isn't a need. You know, there's other ways of intimacy here. Like, mm, I love you. Mm. What do you mean it's not a need? I mean, I, I know there's other forms of intimacy, but that's like not the one I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, that quality time with you. You heard that? Uh-uh. I heard it. You hear it? You heard it, right? Did, did you hear it? Great. Roll the second video. Hey, I feel like we haven't been intimate, like physically intimate in a while. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're having this conversation again. It's been a few weeks. It's not like this is a need. What do you mean it's not a need? Like, it's my need. I need it because it's one of the ways that I feel connected to you and I, I don't get to enjoy that with anybody else. Like, it's just you and me. But there's other forms of intimacy. We look at that and we say, he's neglectful, that's terrible. And yet so often in our society, we give permission to the woman who does the exact same thing to her husband who's pursuing a physical form of intimacy. His need for intimacy is not any less than hers just because it's a different form. Nobody said, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Tell me why. See, it's... it's (laughs) Got my work cut out for me, don't I? Nobody said, "Uh uh-uh, when she told him. (laughs) The only time that God has ever condemned sex is when it's outside of the covenant of marriage. And people struggle with the idea of what they think wants versus needs are. They, they think, look, look at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 1. I'm going to let that video cool down for a minute, and then I'm coming back on it. But I'm going to let you settle for a second, because some of y'all look a little salty about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Put in the Amplified, please. Be up to date with the latest sermons, and listen to Stone Point Community's podcast. It's also a quick and easy way to share these messages with your friends and family. Stay inspired throughout your week and listen. Now as the matters of which you wrote unto me, it is well. And by that I mean advantageous, expedient, profitable, and wholesome for a man not to touch a woman, to cohabitate with her, but to remain. You know what cohabitate means? Living together and ain't married. Verse 2, but because of the temptation to impurity and to avoid immorality, let each man keep his loins in subjection to himself. (laughs) Keep it in his pants. You don't know what a loin is. (laughs) But because of the temptation to impurity and to avoid morality, let each man man up and get himself under control. No, what does he say? Let him have his, and each woman, verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal goodwill, kindness, and what is due to her, What's due to her as a wife. And likewise, now, now I talked about this one time in a video clip, and, and it's amazing to me how social media is, right? The clip went viral. It really did. And people cut off the part where I said, and the husband owes his wife. 
that cut that part off and then just went in. He's saying a man can rape his wife. Nobody said that dumbness. You got to have an IQ below normal body temperature to hear that. Because first of all, let me be very, very clear. My wife can't rape me. She just can't. I am all too willing. <laughs> no, what are you talking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> so then he says, continue on. For the wife does not have and over but the husband has his likewise also exclusive authority or control over but the wife has do not refuse deprive or defraud each other of your due except perhaps by for a time that you may devote yourselves unhindered to prayer. Now notice what he says because here's spiritual people. Oh, I'm, I'm in a moment of fasting and prayer for God. If we ain't agreeing on that, <laughs> you fast on food, you can fast on water, but it says, except by mutual consent, you don't get to fast the cookie <laughs> on your, of your own volition. That ain't how that works. Not even a spiritual reason stops the obligation to your spouse. Are y'all with me? We, 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 you just took it off the screen, eh? <laughs> He said, but even if you did, now watch what he says, but afterwards resume lest to what? Through your... Stop. Can I ask you a question? Why would God tell you you have a lack of restraint if you don't? And more importantly, why does a spouse say to another one, that's not a need. That's just a want. When in fact it is a need. And the same thing, and here's what they'll say. Well, I just, think, I just think they should control themselves. Yet you can't control yourself to give what they're asking for. But they should control themselves to not ask for what they have a conjugal right to in a marriage, because that's the whole point. Where else do you go? If I run out of soda, I can go to the store. Any store. If I want some chips, I can go anywhere and get some chips. God said, there's only one thing that I cannot go anywhere. I think he got I think he got a demon. He just wanted all the time. No, he wants you all the time. Because when you relegate it down to physicality, you forget that you are not understanding how people are wired and how God ordained and created the entire situation. That's why he said, don't defraud. You know what defraud is? Swindling, cheating them, hoodwinking them, double-crossing them. You've been skamooked. <laughs> it's like people just think, oh, oh, well, you know, there's your... No, no, no. It's fraud. You know what fraud is? Fraud is when you say you're going to do something contractually. And then you don't. It's called fraud. <laughs> Does the word say this? You know what fraud means, the definition of fraud? To deprive a victim of a legal right. 
That's fraud. So, <clears throat> what people don't understand is that God created men and women differently. And so, when a man becomes more emotional, women tend to become more sexual. And when a woman becomes more sexual, a man becomes more emotional. It's, it's a cycle between them. It's a, it's a, it's a dance. It's a, it's a give and play. You don't believe me? If you don't believe me, then ask your husband for something afterwards, not before. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> Y'all wonder why Wayne's always smiling? <laughs> wonder no more. <laughs> See, that's a Proverbs 31 woman. Yeah. See, people don't understand. Proverbs 31 is not one woman. It's an amalgamation of all women. Yeah. And he said her husband sings her praises because she knows how to handle him. Listen, every time we go on vacation, my wife will tell you I don't shave. She likes that, and she tells me. She'll walk up to me and grab my face and go, baby, I really like it when you don't shave. <laughs> <laughs> no shaving it is. <laughs> Some of y'all, I really don't like when you, you don't shave. I just think you, you just look like it. And, it's, and, then, and, then, and then the man's like, oh, God. Would you please just. It's okay. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> you men are soft. Okay, you're just soft. I want you to understand. Y'all sit like this. They're like, Pastor, I'm in here with you, but when I leave, <laughs> I ain't going home with you. <laughs> See, but she knows how to come up and, and convince me. Now I'll walk around thinking it's my idea. <laughs> See, because the truth of the matter is chemistry comes and goes. But commitment is forever. And, and people just don't understand. They're like, I, I, you know, I just don't feel. He said, be content with what you have. But it's hard to be content with something you don't have. And then, of course, you know, it leads to marital problems. And then one steps out on the other. And then it's now, well, he's this and she's that and she's this. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Well, he should have controlled himself. We should, I, I, I don't disagree that a man should control himself and a woman should control herself. I don't disagree with that statement. What I disagree with is the idea that how many times are you going to be rejected? And so look at, let's go back to where we started. <laughs> Love y'all. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 19. During this break, you can pull out your phone to leave a review on our Facebook page. Let us know about your experience here at Stone Point. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to leave one for us on Google as well. We're really looking forward to hear what you have to say about Stone Point. Let me read, let me read Proverbs real quick in the message, starting in verse 1, and then I'll come back to verse 19 in the King James. Can we do that? Because Proverbs chapter 5, he says, Dear friend, pay close attention to this wisdom, my wisdom. Listen very closely to the way I see it. Then you'll acquire a taste for good sense. What I tell you will keep you the lips of a seductive woman are so sweet. Her soft words are so smooth. 
But it won't be long before she's like gravel in your mouth. A pain in your or butt. <laughs> a wound in your She's dancing down the perfumed path to death. She's, <laughs> she, she's headed straight for hell and taking you with her. This is why I'm always amazed at how a man could let a woman come into their marriage, a strange woman, a seductive woman, derail their current marriage, and then have it in their head they're going to marry and have gravel in their mouth. Because any decent woman who's not, once they hear you're married, it's like, well, they should, unless they are any man who will date a woman who's married and be intimate with her and know she's married. He's. So he says, taking you with her. She hasn't a clue about real life. You know what that tells you? She's sincere in her behavior. But sincerity is not the same as being right. Just because I'm sincere about it doesn't mean it's the right I lost half of you. Why is that? Stay with me, y'all. She hasn't a clue, a clue about real life, about who she is, because if she valued herself, she would want to be a wife, not a concubine. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. She'd want to be a wife, not a side chick. Keep going. So, my friend, listen closely. And don't treat my words casually. Keep your distance from such a woman. Absolutely stay out of her neighborhood. Don't even go near the block she lives on. <laughs> you don't want to squander your wonderful life to waste your precious life amongst the... Keep going. Why should you allow strangers to take advantage of you? Why be exploited by those who care nothing for you? Do you want to end your life full of regrets? Nothing but skin and bones. Huh? Oh, sin and bones. Sorry, I misread that. <laughs> Saying, oh, why didn't I do what they told me? Why did I reject a... Keep going. Why didn't I listen to my... Or take my teachers... My life is... I haven't one blessed thing. Do you know the saying, drink from your own rain barrel? Draw water from your own spring-fed well? It's true. Otherwise, you may one day come home and find your barrel and your well. Your spring water is for you and not to be passed around among strangers. People are like, oh, we're in an open relationship. Are you crazy? I don't like people touching my money. And that I can get more of. Passing around among strangers. Oh, my God. Never mind. Bless your fresh flowing fountain. Enjoy the wife you married. You know, the, the one when you, what he's saying is when you was excited. When, when you was beating down the door to get married. Come on, pastor, hurry up. We got to get these counseling sessions done. It really takes that long? Yes. Can't we just skip? No. <laughs> then all of a sudden, later on, you just, uh, mm -hmm. because the burning and the desire in you is what created your willingness to be uncomfortable. Once your desire faded, you're no longer willing to risk it for the biscuit. <laughs> 
It's not, I'm, you know, I'm tired. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because if I said, let's go get Chick-fil-A. <laughs> if I said, oh, I want to go to the store and buy you some stuff. Well, come on. You walk a whole mall. <laughs> From one end to the next. Every store. Touch every garment. Enjoy the wife you married as a lovely as an angel, beautiful as a rose. Don't ever quit taking delight. That couldn't have been more perfect. Everybody said, oh, don't quit taking delight in her. Oh, Body. Tell my wife all the time, it ain't your beauty, it's your booty. <laughs> well, there's just something wrong with that. What? 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what he says. Why would, you why would you trade enduring intimacies for cheap thrills with a prostitute? For dalliance with a promiscuous stranger. Again, not somebody you know. Somebody who's twisted. Mark well that God doesn't miss a move you make. He is aware of every step you take. The shadow of your sin will overtake you. You'll find yourself stumbling all over yourself. Death is the reward of an undisciplined life. Your foolish decisions trap you. Isn't that something? Proverbs 5.19. I was having a conversation uh, with Shana right, right after Gio uh, was born. And uh, he said, let her be as a loving hind and a pleasant roe or pleasant doe, which is a deer. And he says, let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. Right? Now, here's what ravished means. Ravished means to seize and to carry off someone by force. Now, he's not telling you to ravish her. He's saying to be ravished with her love. It also means to fill someone with intense delight or to give pleasure to. It's amazing to me how repressive people's ideas are. Because then they interpret that, well, he can just go take it. No, he can't. How's that pleasurable for her? How's that ravishing to her? Right? So he says to always be ravished by her love. But he says, let her breast satisfy thee. My wife and I was having this conversation. We were talking about Gio. We were talking about uh, breastfeeding. And, you know, I don't know anything about breastfeeding. So it's her job to explain it to me. So <clears throat> she says, well, here's what happens. When a baby begins to suckle, um, they start pulling a supply. And she said, now, I said, well, you can't just let him sleep for as long as you. She goes, No. I have to wake, if he doesn't ask for it, I have to wake him up and give it to him. She said, because if he stays on a cycle, it sends a signal that I can create more. And as he uses it, he makes sure I don't lose it. And so, it, but if I stop, then I lose it. It'll stop creating because there's no demand placed for it. So I thought, and, and the Lord brought this to me. He said, this is why I said, look, he said, let her, this is your wife, right? Of all the body parts that your wife has, why did he say her breasts? Let them satisfy you.
Her breasts are not the most satisfying part. <laughs> Thank you for that one. You know why he said that? Because if you don't use it, you lose it. And he said, you should always be pulling. Because as you pull, now she's mad you're constantly pulling. He's upset that you're constantly requesting. But that's twisted. Because God said, I want you to continually at all times, be pulling on that covenant with your spouse so that as you pull, more comes. Because the moment you stop asking, and she said something I thought was so bizarre. She said, even if he doesn't ask for milk, I wake him up. And all the men in the house, you better say. She said, I just can't wait for him. Can I tell you wives something about your husband? And can I tell you husbands something about your wives? If you're not one to really initiate, your wife or your husband loves to have you initiate. If you've got that attitude, it says, well, if he wants to ask. He'll typically just stop asking because he sees it as useless. But you'll come and be like, can I get a hug? And he'll give it to you. You want to know why? Because he knows you need it. If he's smart, he knows you need it. Not want it, need it. But you'd be shocked at how many people, oh, that's just a want. He'll be all right. He's just got to control himself. He got a demon. Let's just, right? Let me call pastor. Get a pastor to cast it out of him. <laughs> he ain't got no demon. Well, I mean, he might be married to one, but. <laughs> but he, he ain't got one. <laughs> he said, let her breast satisfy thee. Her breast. Not no one else's hers. So I then said in this conversation, you know, the Lord uses anything, right? So I said, well, can't like we have a bottle so that we can feed him? Everyone's because here's, here's my heart. I want her to be able to sleep because I'm thinking if I had to get up every two to two and a half hours, I, I'd be ready to kill somebody. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, if we could just introduce a bottle, then that way I can get up and feed him. You can stay asleep. That was genuinely my heart. She goes, he knows the difference. (laughs) He knows the difference between my breasts. (laughs) Y'all don't want to talk to me this morning. The Lord be speaking to you, boy. She said, he knows the difference. So now that he's old enough that we can interject the bottle every once in a while, she'll give him to me and then give me the bottle. There's a reason for that. The reason is, if he's anywhere near her breast, he don't want that strange bottle. (laughs) That's pretty good, ain't it? I know. I'm like, man, message. (laughs) So she'll give me him and the bottle and has to walk away. And then he's like, well, you know. (laughs) Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. But I'm going to take this bottle anyway. (laughs) He's hungry. And he knows. But let her be around. He didn't want that bottle. He was like. (laughs) 
Don't come there with that cheap stuff. <laughs> the real deal. Holy feel. It's just the way it is. But he said, let her breast be the one that satisfies you. No, no one else's. Don't make him go other places. Don't make her look for attention to other places. Don't let her have to go to work and look for some other man to compliment her. Tell her how nice she looks. Send her to work happy and satisfied. So when he got something to say, like, Lane, I don't know, that, that work husband stuff y'all be talking about? Work wife, work husband? The devil is a lie. You got one husband, one wife. Them people at work, you getting that close, it's time to... Oh, that's just my work wife. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a Dr. Brown's bottle. <laughs> Some of y'all know exactly what I said. Some of you don't. Google it. <laughs> we have to understand that God created, if God, if God created sex and God designed sex, then sex ought to be God governed. And God has no issue with marital sex. He said the marriage bed is undefiled. And here Solomon is saying, let me tell you something. Drink from your own cistern. Quit passing the cup. Because the cup is just, it's nasty. And he's speaking from experience. And we see so many places where the Bible talks about the intimacy between a husband and a wife. It's so important. It's critical. It's not a want. It's a need. Nobody ever says, hey, I want to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Most of the time when you have to go really bad to the bathroom, it's usually an inconvenient moment. So you don't want to, you need to. And if it was just a want, God would have said, he would not have said, don't put your spouse in a place where Satan will tempt them. Don't put them in a position to get them tested by Satan. And a lot of people don't know that because of how they deal with their spouse, they're putting their spouse into a temptation. Literally, they're causing the temptation on their spouse. And they're like, well, you just better be strong enough to handle it. Well, I hope you're right. I really do. But the Bible says it's likely you're not. (laughs) Checking the clock. Let's all stand up. (laughs) I'm done with y'all. Tired of y'all looking at me like that. If there are problems, intimate-wise, seek answers. Seek solutions. Google it, for crying out loud. There's all kinds of solutions, ways to resolve these types of things, to keep that in your marriage. The way technology is today, dear God, there's no excuse, none. The only excuse is laziness. But I'm telling you, Satan doesn't want healthy relationships. He doesn't want strong marriages. If you want to destroy the world, you have to start with destroying the family. And if you can decapitate the head of the family, the husband and wife, the body will die. The family will die. The children will be affected. It's it's a deeper plan than you think it is. This is why they said, we, we now think we're naked and we're ashamed. It was all because of the plan. And, it, and the more it gets twisted, the more marriage gets redefined, the more the boundaries get pushed and blurred, the worse it's going to get. Because there is an assignment to destroy the family as we know it. Now, here's what I love. We got all kinds of marriages and babies popping out around here like crazy. So, I mean, this to me, this is like when the ark showed up. Babies just, everybody got babies. Oh, God, I'm getting messages all the time. Having a baby, having a baby, having a baby, having a baby. 
the ones I'm concerned about is where there's no marriage request. Never mind. Never mind. Y'all ain't ready. We just keep going. So, anyway, there's an attack against relationships. And I'm telling you, we want to have healthy, solid, unbreakable relationships. And if you walk away with anything today, please walk away with this. Please understand that the canary in the mine is sex life. And maybe there are seasons, maybe there are times, maybe there are situations that we have to work through, change, whatever. My goal is to make you mindful of wherever you are, do better. Wherever you are, do better. If you're like, well, you know, we're doing all right, do better. If you know that canary is dead, lay hands on it. If you're like, it's great, then make it fantastic. Send your wife or your husband to work whistling. And the church said, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for the clarity that you always bring to us that we, so we don't be twisted, that we get it straight, that we get it clear, that we get it right, because we know there's so much counting on this. We are purposeful in our hearts to protect the institution of marriage that you created when you said that a man should leave and he should cleave. So, Father, we thank you that unit that's been created between a husband and wife. Father, there's no other covenant higher than that except for the one that we have with you. And so we begin to realize the importance of it, and we'll put pressure on our covenant and not on anything outside. We thank you. We love you. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. Thank you for listening to today's message. I hope you'll subscribe so you can receive the latest podcast to keep encouraged and inspired all through the week. Help us to continue to share the message of hope with those all around the world. Visit scc.church or click the link in the description to partner with us today. We hope you share this message with a friend and be sure to follow us on social media. We're praying for you. I know God's best is still ahead. We will see you next time.